Thank you for praying for us. Thank you for this prayer that you inspired the apostle with. And I pray, Father, as we carefully look at this together, we we'll truly be amazed by what you have given us, but also amazed how often we forget it. I pray that you awaken us fresh, instruct us, correct us, affirm us today by your Spirit. We bless you and thank you, in Jesus' name. By word have I hidden my heart that I might not sin against thee. Let's be seated. This passage, in fact, this whole book of Ephesians, we looked at this last week, the third chapter, I find myself um, reflecting on, after you finish a book study, on what's next? What are we going to do next? And then people ask, what are you doing next? What are you doing next? What are you doing next? And so I'm very captivated by these sermons, or prayers, excuse me, the prayers of the Apostle Paul. And as we've looked at different book studies, we've looked at, we see them in almost all of his epistles. And so for the next um, few weeks, I'm going to look at these prayers with you. Recognize that, <clears throat> powerful thing, we, we, all, we believe the Bible is inspired, right? When you say that, some people say, well, it's inspired in its original autographs. You know, the originals were inspired. Paul wrote, that was the inspired part. <clears throat> and as it was sent to someone else, they were the beneficiaries of that inspired word. <clears throat> Excuse me. But as time passed, and as the, those epistles start to circulate, then churches that had them for a while made meticulous copies of those letters of Paul. So they had their own copy of a letter. And then they would circulate to the next church, and the church would make its meticulous copy, and so forth and so on, until finally there were just hundreds, hundreds of copies of each of these epistles of the, of the Apostle Paul. And people stopped looking at them as Paul praying for Ephesus, or Paul praying for Colossae, or Paul praying for Thessalonica, or something like that, and they began to recognize the inspiration of the scriptures, that this was something that breathed out to them as they read it. And they recognized in this that this was Paul's prayer for the Ephesians, but at the same time it's the Holy Spirit's prayer because he put it into Paul's mouth and heart, and now it breathes out to us. And so we take it as our own. And if you take that idea and say, when Paul was praying this, do you think the Holy Spirit, who is, of course, present and always present, eternal, do you think he knew that he was going to do that, or he just decided to do that as it kind of circulated? Well, this is looking pretty good. Maybe I'll let everybody know this is for them. No, it was from the beginning. And so as we read these words, we have a sense that he's actually praying for us that these things will be true in our lives. Am I getting that right? Do you think I'm getting that right, right? I think I am. And as we read them, we are overcome sometimes by the, the power of them, and the beauty of them, and the instruction we see here. But most importantly, it's a prayer to God for us to be this or that. To experience it, to come into it. So it's not just intellectually trying to cap capture it. We see these things are really press our lives. I think in terms of the Holy Spirit and His work, it's not just an intellectual thought the Holy Spirit's work. I intellectually believe that in my brain. I mean, you've read Psalms, or you've been, have read the Scriptures, you're by yourself, and you have a sense that God is speaking to you. It just it touches you, doesn't it? it? presses into your life, into your spirit, into your own soul as a result. I'm not setting this up to say this is what's going to happen today. I'm just saying this is the process and the trust that we have that when we, when we read this prayer, it's a prayer to us. We read an epistle, it's an epistle to us. God's word is for us in every generation. That's why it's sustained, not only by people, but by the Holy Spirit itself. 
Peter said this, that men were moved along by the Holy Spirit to write. And then all the records and all the descriptions of the process of copying from uh, manuscript to manuscript, from then translation to translation, there's a sense of tremendous care and holiness being set aside to be sure you don't just take, take advantage of things. Just You won't say, well, the people that translate, they just wrote whatever they want. No, that wasn't the case at all. They took it literally as holy. In fact, in many cases when they're making copies, they would make a mistake on the last page. They'd tear the whole manuscript and burn it. Start all over again so you can make a meticulous copy and never have a single stroke of pen that is misplaced. Yet still there was human, of course there's human elements that exist, variants and so forth like that. Those things are so minute that sometimes you think, I mean, if you really want to get into this, read uh, Machen's uh, concordance on Bible all the, all the variants in the Bible, it's about that thick, and it goes through all these things, and just little things like, well, this letter right here, you know, this is wrong, and this is this, and this, and this. And, but it makes no, no, no change in the overall meaning of the Scriptures. I mean, we can be confident that this is God's Word we're reading today. Confident not only in that historical um, record, that historical process, but also in our own sense of inspiration. You know, the original ones who chose and said, these are the... This is a canon of scripture. These are the ones that we choose among many, many hundreds. One of the characteristics was, does it have the sense of inspiration in it? God is speaking. Well, that's what their, their role, uh, goal was, and that's our goal. As a result, we have this contact, this connection between that time frame and this time. And we can see in this text of Scripture, as much as any, that Paul is very, absolutely overwhelmed with thanksgiving, with wonder and praise. He is a recipient of what he is telling us. You know, if I get up here and say, well, you know, that's him, that's him, that's him, and you don't have any sense that I can believe this stuff, you know, what, what are we doing? Are we transferring anything at that point? But he is a recipient of this. I sometimes think Paul has this scratch. It's like that scratch in the middle of your back. You ever get those scratches in the middle of your back? Well, I saw it. I got this really, really nice back scratch. He's got this big hook on it. I could get anything on my body now. That's great. But I can remember those times you get scratched and trying to find something here. You know, get that scratch. That's kind of how he is. He talks about the majesty and glory of God. He, tries, he changes it. He tries to add another word or two. He tries to get there. He doesn't seem to quite scratch it, you know. But while he's trying to scratch it, he's getting closer and closer and closer. You know, the sparks are going off of beauty and glory and majesty. The gospel is real. It's filled with its own substance. And that substance is the complete work of Jesus Christ was utterly righteous. Jesus was crucified and condemned and he was utterly righteous. In prison ministry, it's not really true anymore. It's really true that people in prison say they're not, no one's guilty. In the church that I minister in, in Hagerstown, Grace Church in Hagerstown, you can't be a member of the church unless you honestly confess you are where you are because you deserve to be there. If you come in and say, well, I want to be a part of the church, but, you know, I'm not really guilty. I got, I got messed up and robbed. And blah, 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 blah. They, they cheated me in the courts. And, blah, blah, blah. and I remember one guy that was so troubled by this. And he said, he said to me, he said, he says, whatever it takes, I'll swear to you, I'll do whatever. I, I didn't do this. But then he said, you know, I, if I broaden the with the larger scope of my life, I produced an environment in which this kind of terrible thing could happen. It was my fault. You can't ever get to the place where you, you, you might say, well, I didn't do that. You did the whole wrong. And we see the sense of need as the gospel reveals an utterly righteous person who 
experience deep suffering, a violent death, a powerful resurrection, a glorious ascension, a majestic session, coming in and being seated before God, completing His mission. And then He, along with the Father, dispatching the Holy Spirit into the earth to regenerate those in that context of sin, awakening them, Paul being among them, calls himself the chief sinner, calls himself a blasphemer, but God, in His own good pleasure, His own purpose, awakened him through new birth. Is that your experience? Or do you think, well, you know, of course God chose me because I'm just everything He wants. You know, He got my resume, He saw everything on there is what He wanted, so He hired me because I, you know, I fit everything on His bill. You know, sometimes that's how we look at it. So we say, you say, Jesus loves you. Well, of course He does. You kind of get to work and say, you're a great worker. Well, of course I am. Instead of seeing ourselves as in comparison to Jesus Christ, as He is utterly righteous, we are utterly unrighteous. You can hold up your little thing, your five things you did right, but in the backdrop is this great big huge grizzly bear saying, this is really who I am. Don't just ignore him. I, I did this good thing. <laughs> and he and the Father sent the Holy Spirit. You know, the, the work of the Father and the Son is to perpetually send, eternally to send the Spirit into the world, regenerating his redeemed, so that they might preach the gospel and thereby participate in the full gathering of his elect. That's who we are. We're in our turn reaching the four winds of the earth. We're in our world reaching the four winds of the earth, which it always comes back to. What we need is wisdom. We need revelation. We need calling, and we need power. The Apostle knows that only God can provide these powerful tools for our life. And so he turns to the Father, listening to what the Father has done, and then praying these things for us. It's much like the proverb we studied a few weeks ago, where we Teaching is instruction, sitting at the knee or standing at the knee. And here the apostle is praying for those who perhaps are wandering a bit in their faith, disillusioned in their faith, or new in their faith. So he opens this portion of this epistle with the words, For this reason... Ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, for this reason, he says. Of course, we ask ourselves the question, what reason is he talking about? What's he talking about? Well, it's very easy to discover. It always comes before, right? He's not, he doesn't start his letter with, for this reason. He starts it here in the 15th verse. But if we look at verses 4 through 6, we recognize that it says He chose us in Him before the creation of the world. That's a pretty good reason to pray for us. In verse 7 and 8, He redeemed our nature and cleansed our sins. I, I think this is something we should think about over and again. He redeemed us. He purchased us. He purchased our life, all of our life. The good, the bad, the ugly. He purchased it all. As is. It's his. He owns it. As a result, he has the disposition on it of treating it the way he wants to treat it. By his spirit, we recognize the way he treats his, treats us. He doesn't leave us in darkness, he doesn't leave us in a contemptible place. He, by his spirit, sanctifies us more and more so that we reflect better. If you think the Holy Spirit is trying to make you something, you can stay on your own, you're wrong. He is out there with his cloth and his Windex and he is spraying and he is cleaning so that you reflect God more and more. And that original image-bearing purpose that we have all the way back to Adam. He redeemed us. And then the sins that we have and will commit and are committing, he forgives. 
cleanses them. Isaiah's statement, he washes them white as snow. Though you be as crimson, you shall be as wool. For the purpose of redemption, he reveals Christ to be the center of all history and eternity. In verses 9 and 10. For the power of redemption, he brought us into conformity with his power and his will. He brings us into conformity with his will. You are my witnesses, Jesus said. He doesn't say, go and be a witness. He says, you are already my witnesses. Into the world. And for who do you stand to? Apostles are wondering, well, I thought you were supposed to come back to Jerusalem and be you know, the king of kings and lord of lords and reign on the throne of Jerusalem. And now you're up here on a mountain. I don't know what we're on the mountain for, but you're alive, so that's really great. So let's get back to work. And next thing you go, off he goes. Those are his disciples. You think you're confused. <laughs> you think you don't sometimes have a sense of what you're supposed to be doing. Imagine what they're like. Here's their, their total source of everything. And he says, take it off. Gone. And then a few minutes later, they're still looking up at this guy. <laughs> that was a pretty good trick. I think he's come back in a minute. He'll be back. He'll be back. <laughs> He'll drop us a note saying, I'll meet me at the temple in Jerusalem. Okay. No. And then the angel comes and says, what are you doing? Go and do what he told you to do. Now, Jesus can speak to us, and he, if, if he spoke, he does by his word. And so he's, an angel comes and speaks to us. What do you think the angel's going to say? You're going to have a powerful healing ministry. Go and do what he told you to do. And it's very clear. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the whole earth. That's what they're supposed to do. And shortly, it only took 120 days of hiding. And the Spirit came upon them. And that's precisely what they did. They were filled with power and will and purpose. They went proclaiming the wonderful works of God. What is that wonderful work? It's Christ, his life, suffering, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, session, and sending the Holy Spirit. So it sure must be like a song to us. We see those powerful statements of power and will. For the preservation of redemption, we see the plan of redemption, the provision of redemption, the purpose of redemption, the power of redemption, and the preservation of redemption. We have received the Holy Spirit, it says in 13, as our guarantee of eternal life. Deposit, guarantee our perseverance in Christ. You, you know, you're going to go into a battle, you're going to go into a task, and guess what? There's a great deal of fear. You just think you're going alone, but he's, you're not going alone. The Holy Spirit is both with you and is protecting you in that battle, in that process. Don't be afraid of evangelism. Don't be afraid of sharing the gospel. Don't be afraid when you hear that, that little sound that you know people give. You know, where they tell you about how they're so sad or they're so upset or something happened. And where's God? All those kinds of little peeps you hear out of people. They're all opportunities to respond. He used to say this, the giant food, managers would come over and say, you know, you, know, you really got to stop doing this thing to everybody. Everybody talks to you, you know, you're doing this thing where they're, you know, next thing you know they're talking about Jesus. I said, I've only answered some questions. I've never pressed anybody. I've only answered questions because people have a lot of questions. <laughs> I always say, I said to somebody recently, it's that peeping sound the elect make. There's something about it. They want to answer. They want to get through. Because they're right there waiting. It's like, it's like a chicken, a cherry on a tree. It's nice and ripe to talk to you. What was that? <laughs> no, I'm not going to pick that cherry. I feel a little bit uncomfortable picking cherries. Even though I'm the <laughs> cherry picker. I've been commissioned to go out here and pick cherries, but you know, I'm not sure I want to pick that cherry. What do you think here? What's this stupid? What do you think? Who do you elect? There's people waiting out here. People, 
You know, Spurge used to pray for those who are out in the world who today, they're, they're unsaved, but they're ready to be saved. Because we have a sense of God's power and will. Christ being the center of all history and eternity. Because our nature is redeemed and our sins are cleansed, there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You can't have people come say, well, you're just a bigger sinner than me. Well, of course I am. That's why I need Jesus. I love those kind of questions. You Christians think you're perfect. I said, oh, no, far from it. I mean, trust me. But I've heard people say, you Christians think you're, you're, you're perfect. Someone goes, that cherry just talked to me. I'm a cherry picker, but you know, I, I shouldn't pick that cherry. Stott wrote this book called Our Guilty Silence. It's all about this idea that we won't. We feel uncomfortable. We feel like we're not worthy to be fruitful. It's far from the case. And then we see it every time Paul prays. He says, for this reason, for all these glorious positions and gifts that God has put at our disposal, for this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all of God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Ever since I heard about your faith, you're a believer. When you become a believer, someone hears you're a believer, there's an expectation about what you're about now. I became a Christian. You still hear them. Their, their language is the same. Their actions are the same. The things they like to laugh about are the same. Everything's the same. Things they like to do are the same. But I'm now a Christian. You sit down and say, okay, well, let's, let's talk what a Christian is. What it is that you are as a Christian. Tell me what it is you are as a Christian. And you may get the idea, well, you know, I accepted Jesus, all right? was born again or whatever. It's like, well, it, there should be recognition that there's going to be a change now taking place in you. Paul is very quickly moving to that position. Ever since I've heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, your love for all of God's people, I have not stopped doing what? Giving thanks for you. I see what you are, and I, Paul's pretty excited here, by the way. This is... This literature is, this, this language is not somebody who's just saying, okay, well, I heard you're a Christian. So I thought I'd just kind of just you know, come over and say hi. You know, like a, the new neighbor bring a pie over for you. No. That's exhilaration as he sees that God is doing something. He's powerfully using his word to open the eyes of unbelievers. Paul is still excited every time he sees it. Still excited. You hear somebody say, I was so, wherever I was, I was there and I just, God awakened me. Does this excite you? It's evidence that God's real. This is real. If we just keep preaching the gospel and then you know, everybody just, you know, well, that's nice for you. Go, just, you know, I'll, I'll tolerate you while you do it. And we have a sense that. This is all, this is all awful nice. Maybe something happened to me. This really isn't something that's going on, continuing to go on. That's not Paul's position. He sees this as first fruits of regeneration. The idea that they love one another. These are evidences of new birth. Do you remember this phrase? Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. It's in Matthew chapter 22, verse 36. Since I heard about your, your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, your love for his people. What's he saying there? Loving God, loving people is evidence of commandments being adhered to. I have to stop giving thanks for you. 
I got so excited when I heard about this, I just can't stop thanking God for this. I remember when my first daughter was born, Christy, you know, here she is, bring her home, and all this kind of, she's the first Karen's pregnant, you know, and that, that step, you've never been through that before, and then she has a baby, you've never been that through that before, and you bring this little thing home, sit in the bed, you've never been that before, and so we go and we lay down, and just all of a sudden we get up and say, you know, i got to go in there just a second. We go and look and say, that's really our baby. <laughs> That really is our baby. We say it all the time. We just constantly do that. Second, third, fourth, all of them, same thing. That's really our baby. Here's Paul saying, man, that's really, that's really a product of God's work. The idea that Paul had not stopped giving thanks to the Ephesian believers is very noteworthy. What's he giving thanks for? Is it the work he sees in these new believers? Or is he seeing God's work in these new believers? Their actions are not indeed, could not be the result of their own efforts. People don't say, I'm born again by my own efforts. They don't say that. It's, it's amazing. You don't have anybody that you know that ever claimed to be a Christian that hadn't had something happen to them from the divine. Am I right? Paul sees that. You should be looking for it. I should be looking for it. It's God's work. Paul is as surprised as us. This thing he's scratching over and over again to preach a gospel that is pure and is right and is correct, finding in it the power of God. I have not stopped giving thanks for you. Uh, it's not by my it's not by power, but by my spirit. Paul had these all these verses kind of hidden in him as a Pharisee. You know, Pharisees memorize, they then, then, are, then articulate, and then they dissect the Old Testament. Paul was chief among them. And then when he received Jesus as his own Savior, they just all get reshifted, and they're now in a whole different context. His worldview is completely different. And he sees this text of Scripture, it's not by might, it's not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Almighty, in Zechariah chapter 4. And I have not stopped giving thanks for you, and I remember you in my prayers. What a sense of continual awe of thanksgiving to God. I keep asking. By the way, Paul perhaps sees the fruit of these first prayers today. Praying for you. He's excited about you. Can't stop thinking about you. We can't. God can't stop thinking about us. Praying for you. Someone's praying for you today. I keep asking the God of the Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Notice the direction of Paul's prayers. He's not praying to them. He's not thinking that they need to do something different, that they need to be instructed, they need to grow, they need to act. He's praying and asking that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, give you the spirit of wisdom. Not you must have the spirit of wisdom, you must act for the spirit of wisdom, you must work for the spirit of wisdom. You know, so often in Christianity we get this so confused so quick. We're told we need to be discipled, we need to work, we need to think, we need to memorize, we need to do all these things ourselves. These are all part of the divine grace of God. As He produces these things in us, He gives these things to us. Otherwise, we become pretty haughty. You know, there's some people in the world, they're very smart, they've got a lot of degrees, and man, they are the most arrogant people on earth. And they think because of all their knowledge, they got it. But so... It's so refreshing to see someone in that kind of a context. In their humility, they put off the praise. And they resist the sense of what they have. And they you really truly see that they believe this is the grace of God that they have what they have and where, and where they are. Is that your sense there? Or did you work the way to get here? No. It's God's work. 
I'm asking that the God, our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, He may give you the spirit of wisdom. Wisdom, the application of God's person and nature and word. It's how God works. It will give you the spirit of how God works. Nothing more powerful than that. What wisdom is, is not, again, something you gain. Ask for wisdom, and God will give it to you, and then you have it, you can exert it somehow. No, it always is God's wisdom. It's a part of His nature. It's part of His person in us, and how He works. And then revelation is understanding God's person and His nature. The uncovering of who He is. Revelation, to uncover something that is covered. And he wants us to have it. A sense of how God works and is working, and also a sense of who God is and His person, so that you may know Him better. I think I told you the story of this young man who came powerfully to the Lord. He was just kind of wandering in a church, and he got saved, and he was in church all the time, and became very committed to our church in Germantown. <clears throat> Still walking with the Lord. And he, we were talking about knowing God, and he said, I said, well, tell me about your life. So my father's an elder in a church, Presbyterian church. Presbyterian church. He's an elder. And he said, I, was, I told my father about how I've been born again, and I'm really excited, and I'm growing in the Lord, and all this kind of stuff. My father's kind of casually, you know, affirming that. I said, why aren't you excited about this? He said, well, you yeah, know, it's just God stuff. He said, you're an elder in a Presbyterian church. He said, I know. He said, well, don't you believe in God, Dad? Do you believe in God, Dad? Elder for years. You know what his answer was? No, not really. I don't believe in God. He says, You're the elder in a Presbyterian church. How could that possibly be? He said, Well, they never asked me if I believe in God. They just asked me if I want to be an elder. <laughs> kind of makes your head blow up, doesn't it? They never asked me if I believe in God. Engage with 
We have true sense this is what God has lined up. And we share the gospel with them. What is the gospel? Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And the expansion of that is the gospel. The gospel is there, but the expansion of there is the gospel too. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you're saved. It's not a gospel of do this, do this, do this, do this, don't do that, do that, do that, do that, which sometimes is what people think that Christianity really is. No, it's a gospel of saving us by grace. And Paul is praying that they may have a hope to which he has called them right now. Pray that you'll have a hope about why you're here. Because let me tell you something. You get this confused and you start getting depressed. You start feeling like you're dislodged. Like I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I feel like I'm wasting my time. It doesn't stop anything that God's called you into vocational or something like that. But it, you recognize that that vocation is a pathway in my world. Go into all your world, Jesus said. Preach the gospel. That must be true. That must be true. It can't be go into all the world. Like, you know, you've got to go out and make sure that all the world, everywhere you have responsibility, go out as far as you can go. You know, I didn't get here because my parents were determined they were going to come to this part of the world. They were born here. Our ancestors were born here. Some of us were, came in through other means. But this is the world we're in. So what are we going to do? We're going to say, well, go to all the world. I feel real guilty because I'm not really going to all the world. No, it's your world. Paul said, after preaching to all the regions of the Roman world, I have preached the gospel to whom? The whole world. talking about. He thinks he preached the gospel to the whole world. He preached the gospel to his world. The Roman world. What's your world? Listen, when I heard this first time, it just made me free. I hope this is an awakening for us as we, re as we hear this prayer. That you may have a hope of your calling. And where's your calling to? It's your world. I told the guys what Thursday night, talk about this general idea of what our world is. I said, you know what happens to me when I come to this prison? I go up and they, first of all, they recognize me. But then they demand I have give them identification. So I give them my driver's license. She takes my driver's license. She asks me why I'm here. I tell her I'm here for the chapel. She goes over her little thing. Goes, blah, 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 blah. She finds a sheet, pulls it out, and says, okay, you're on the chapel record. So now what you can do is you can take all the metal out of your off your person. Take your belt off, take your shoes off, take everything off, take those pins out, everything. Just stick it in this blue box. And, no, the shoes go in the blue box, excuse me. Everything else goes in the red box. Take your shoes off too. That cell phone, put a locker in there. This is just hello. This is hello. Okay? And then they take me through this device. Warning! Warning! I don't know. If I got any metal on me anywhere, like, warning, warning. <laughs> oh, gosh. First time I heard that, I had some, a nickel in my pocket or something. <laughs> so you get through here, and then they they come over to me, and they say, spread your legs, put your arms out. And they pat me down. As if that warning, warning didn't get it. They're sure there's a gun in some place that I've made and put in my purse. No. They pat me down. Then they say, all right, I'm barefooted. I'm not, you know, they said, let me see your feet. You go, like this, and like this. Okay, am I in yet? Nope. Still just introducing myself. Then I go over, and they put this yellow band on my arm, which last Thursday night she hooked into a hair. Ooh. And then she stamps me. She stamps me. And then she says, okay, now you can go. And so now I've just gone through the guardhouse. And I walk out, and I walk down the way, and I wave to the guy behind the, you know, the glass, and he goes, <clears throat> opens his gate. And I go in quick, and it closes behind me, and then I go, I'm in this barbed wire corridor, and then I have to go to the next gate on the other side, <clears throat> opens that, and I go through there. I'm still not in the prison, okay? <laughs> then I walk up through the actual another guard station and I stand there until the guy finally sees me through a, a window I, can't, I mean it's, it's all glass everywhere I can't see anybody it's all dark and 
glass, and then all of a sudden the door goes. <laughs> I walk through there, and now I'm in another place where there's four doors that are all around me. And then I have to take my hand and stick it through a hole, and the guy looks at it and scans it, makes sure it's there, it's a proper scan. As if, you know, where would I get this? You know what I mean? <laughs> and how would I get there if I didn't have this? So it, but it's security. Scans it, he sees this, and then he looks at this and sees I got a yellow man. Then he says, you, you, you go, thank you. you and no one, no, no one's guards smile at you. They're all thinking, you're, you're just as bad as everybody else in here. That's the thing, they've got this guard look on their face, you know. It's kind of look on them. Never mind. So then I, another door goes, <laughs> and now I'm out in the compound, okay, and now all these people are walking around. Some are going to chapel, and so I go into chapel. So I described this, I said, it's hard to get into your world. And by the way, just to get to that point, I had to fill out like, you know, three dozen forms. You know, forms like, if you ever get raped, you'll record it. Oh, okay. <laughs> if you see anybody else getting raped, you'll record it. Oh, okay. I mean, you should see women when they go in and they see that. They go, they say to me, Pastor, I can get raped from Missouri. Possibly. I said, no. no. I mean, it's endless. It, literally 12... Forms that I have to fill out to get there. Background checks. Just to get to the place where I can hand my driver's license goes. I said, guys, it's hard to get into your world. How'd you get here so easily? <laughs> now think about that. That's that's a real situation. Yeah. But you know what? The amazing thing? Not all, but many of those men believe. This is my world, and I'm going to reach it with the gospel. And we see amazing things happen. When's the last time you went to a baptismal service and baptized 45 people? And you do that five times a year. Because so many people are making professions of faith. What an amazing thing. And their world, it's just something. Because they decide, this is my world, it's trying to reach. Remember that when we talked about CTS the very first time, Martin? And, and Martin, it was very insightful. I, these guys are saying, what do you, you know, what, they say, this is, if I get this degree in, in theology, then will I be able to get a job when I get out? And I was kind of like, you know, I don't know. And then realized that most of these people, Mark said, well, most of these people are probably lifers, right? They're not going to ever get out. So if you just give them the degree so they get a job when they get out, what are you doing? It all changed. We just changed the whole thing. And I've been saying to them since that time, this is for your ministry in this context. To enhance your knowledge and wisdom. That hope for which you are called is so critical in prayer. If a Christian doesn't have a sense of a calling and a hope that this is what God has given you, you won't go anywhere. You'll be literally the cherry picker and you have no sense of what you're supposed to do in that vineyard. Paul is praying this for the person. That the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you and the riches of his glorious inheritance as people. The second focus of this prayer is that the Ephesians might come to know the riches of the glorious inheritance in his Holy people, so often we overlook this. We live in community. Christianity is not an individual religion. We live in community together. I remember one time, a pastor's wife always used to leave worship. And the way I led worship was everybody had to worship. You weren't worshiping. I start exhorting you to worship, not just you personally. But, you know, there's some people here just start worshiping. You're not raising hands. You're not singing. You're not, you're not paying attention. There's no. You like to put, you know, statues in the church. So then, Mrs. Klein, she said one time, she said, John, let me take, let me give you some advice. She said, nobody that's coming to this church is coming by compulsion. They really want to be here. And so the idea of pulling your whip out every Sunday morning and doing the rawhide routine, roll, 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 you know, to get them to worship, it's just not, they're not, they, they already want to come 
because they want to worship in this way. And we think in terms of the Word of God. The Word of God is something, I assume everybody's here because you really want what's going on right this second. Oh, I should be, you know, politely getting up, going for the exits. Which I've, you know, seen from time to time. <laughs> we're looking for friendships. We're looking for relationships. We're looking for like-mindedness. We're looking for corporate vision. We're looking for individual affirmation of who we are and what we're doing. It's the riches of the glorious inheritance of God's holy people. And it's a phenomenon that's, that's eternal, but yet it's now. It exists now. The church will continue to exist in heaven. We don't think about this as much as we should. I want you to come to my church because we have fellowship there. We have friendship there. We have a sense of calling there. We're linking together. We're supporting each other. When you get sick, someone's going to know it. Someone's going to pray for you. When you're in trouble. Someone's going to try to help you. We see in this glorious prayer... The statement of the hope which he has called us and the riches of his glorious inheritance of the saints. He's praying that we will experience these rich blessings now and eternally and really hook into that. Hook into that. And, he says, that we will have a sense of the hope which he is calling and sense that you may know his incomparable great power for us who believe. His great power for us who believe. Romans chapter 1 and verse 10 and 12, the Apostle Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's one of the TMS top of memory system verses that we learned so many years ago. I used to think, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, you know, I'm going to to be an outright Christian. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And he says then, the second phrase is, for therein is the power of God. It's not just, I, it's not just internal, I say, well, I'm just not going to be ashamed of the gospel. I'm going to be an open Christian. If someone says, are you a Christian? I'm going to say, yes, I'm a Christian. You know, if somebody had me up with a gun against my head, would you confess Jesus as the Lord? Yes, I would. Bang, I did. So I'm going to be someone who's not ashamed of the gospel. We put all this to the front end. It says, because therein is the power of God. If you're preaching to someone something, but it's not the gospel, there's no power in it. If you tell them everybody gets to heaven because they die, which basically is the classic perspective that we've looked at and hooked into in our society. When people die, we should pity them, and somehow they're with God. Even in the context. Oh, I remember maybe, I remember maybe they said something about one time. They said, oh, I think I told God. I think something said one, some religious term once. I saw a extra book, book that's a little sticker that they have on their, on their bedside. <laughs> Boy, that's the, that's the, if that's the assurance of salvation. <clears throat> my goodness. It's been the gospel. I say, believe the gospel. And I recognize that my belief of the gospel was because of the power of God that was exerted on me. That I was unconditionally elected by God. Irresistible grace, I came to Him. Do you believe that? Maybe it's kind of just, you know, I'm here, I just wandered in. Just wandered in. Regeneration is a powerful thing. The gospel produces a powerful response upon people. Jesus said the kingdom of God is advancing and it brings a powerful, awesome power, change in people's life. It disrupts us. Yeah, you, you thought you were going to be this and do that and do the other thing. You hear, you hear people all the time, Pope, I, well, I was on my way to being this and man, God arrested me and now here I am. stay here in this church, at Grace Church, because I want to finish some things that I've finished. I want to be, I want to continue to witness to this person who's my roommate. I, I know I'm, I'm 
getting out mandated to get out in three months, but you think in three months I can do this, this, and this, and this? That's, that's a powerful change in somebody's life. And you have these guys that have calendars. I remember when I was in military school, I had a calendar. You know what I did? I couldn't wait for about 9 o'clock at night. I go, that day is gone. <laughs> couldn't wait. Can't wait to get out. People say, you think in three months I can do this, 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 and this, 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 in this world I'm in? One guy said, I really don't want to leave until, <laughs> I'm thinking, what? Are you, are you nuts? Of course you want to leave. Don't, don't say that. No, it's a person who's recognized that there's an incomparably great power for us who believe. And that power, he says, is the same as the mighty strength that he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the Heavenly Father. Imagine the immensity of the power of rise, raising a man from the dead. The immensity of absorbing all the sins of his people in the grave. And having done that work of suffering, that work of dying, that work of being buried, wrestling and taking into himself, into his, his utter righteousness, the sins, paying the debt for us, redeeming us in that grave, and then rising from the dead because death could no longer hold him. That's a little, death could no longer hold him. Oh, 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 oh. You try to make a dead person come to life. Anybody ever seen a dead person right in front of you? Remember, it's a little boy. I, Jumped over the back fence to go play, and Tag somehow followed me, our dog, our Cocker Spaniel. I went right across Granite Avenue, and I had a fun time playing. Come back, and where's Tag? Well, Tag's not here. He's out on the floorboard of the car. I remember sitting there as a little, you know, eight-year-old boy, and I was praying, God, please let Dad go back to life. I could pray all day, all night, next day, I could fast and pray for four. Tag's going to lay there. Dead people don't rise. One rose to eternal glory. And the power that was exerted to bring Christ into that position, to raise him from the dead, and to bring him to a position of being seated at the right hand in the heavenly realms. That power, that unlimited, that glorious power, is the same power that regenerates the heart of people. That's the power we have at our disposal. We don't have some, you know, a little flashlight, we hope it'll work, you know. We're linked into the real stuff. He says, it's foolishness. The foolishness of the cross is the power of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. He exerted this power and we also recognize this power gives us a, a touch with the one who is far above all authority and power and dominion forever and ever. And you're Paul White trying to scratch it, isn't he? Trying to scratch it. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is invoked. Not only in the present age, but in every age and the ages. exertion of power, he placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything. For the church. Everything. All this. For the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. I pray that you will have your eyes open. You will be enlightened so you will see these simple, foundational, first things about the faith. Do you see them? Give it a second look. You can look at this on Facebook. See it again. Get the auto recording. See it again. Read a Bible. Go get somebody else's sermon. Get them to preach it. You know, look up John Stott's sermon on this, or 
James Montgomery Boyce's sermon on this, or a hundred others on this, and you get the same thing. We are linked in.